Hello and welcome to the final of our podcasts on the subject of cost of living that we're doing this year. So um, we thought we'd have a little bit of a look back over the year and also a look into the year ahead. Um, so it's just Hannah and me today. Um, yeah, we started actively reporting on cost of living um, when I presented a local authority research event in June. And it soon became very clear that a lot of our clients across the spectrum, so right through from the local authority to, to our sort of private sector clients, were really looking for an understanding of what's really going on in the world of cost of living, what's going on uh, behind the potentially stark headlines that we're seeing in the news, and yeah, what does it actually mean for them and their business? So that's rapidly grown into this regular set of podcasts and our occasional more sector-focused content. So at the end of this session, I'm going to talk about what we've got planned for the few months ahead. But first of all, let's um, catch up with Hannah. So Hannah, over the six months that we've been working on this, what do you think are the biggest changes that you've seen in that time? It's a really, it's a really broad question, I guess, first of all, um, just because so much has changed since we started doing it. And I can't believe it's been six months that we've been talking about this now, really. Um, I did do a bit of looking back over previous stuff that we talked about just for a bit of reflection. And I think, the, the, I mean, the biggest thing that stuck out to me alarmingly was the numbers that we were talking about in, in June versus what we're talking about now. I remember um, everyone being really worried. And actually that first scenario that you did, um, we were looking at broadly 3% inflation across most things, except food. I think food was at 9%. Um, and I mean, we're talking about much greater inflation rates than that. So people didn't even quite expect at that time how 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 severe this whole cost of living crisis was going to be. So that that really stuck out to me. And I guess in a similar vein, uh, the interest rates that have become quite a focal thing of what we're talking about and what we have been talking about over the last month or so um, was really on the back burner when we first started talking about all of this stuff. And actually, um, the most doom mongery. Um, skeptics were thinking okay if the bank of england put their interest rates up by 1.5 percent we're all gonna you know be in quite a situation what we're looking at now is nearly six percent um so we i don't think we ever quite imagined where we'd where we'd end up even just at the end of this year so um yeah without wanting to be too negative at the end of the year that those are the those are the big things um that stuck out to me i guess i'll throw a very similar question back to you do you have any headlines that have really stuck out to you across anything else uh, anything that stayed with you that you, you still remember yeah I think the the big one which is I have to say I questioned this statistic and then sort of had discussions with other people internally and went actually this does stack up is the one that came out of our se September survey where it revealed that one in 10 households said that they're expecting to use a food bank in the next 12 months yeah. now that however you unpack that that's a big number. Yes, you can say people are inflating that view. But what one of my colleagues pointed out is the most key stat of that is that it had doubled since March. So, yeah, whether you agree with those numbers or not, between March and September, we went from a, a world where one in 20 said that they felt that they might have to use a food bank to a one in 10. And then you hear stuff coming out from people like Trussell Trust, who are doing amazing work in this. And you go, well, really, this is what's going on and yeah what was interesting there was also the number of 35 to 44 age group who were saying this was a real concern for them and again that's most likely the areas with sort of more children um so yeah i think it's very easy in a sort of commercial world to be sitting here talking about sort of what does this mean for our customers but i think that really did hit home the how the most vulnerable are really being impacted by this most, how it is spreading through um, different demographic groups. Um, and I think that another sort of quite stark stat that we've we've seen at various points right through from the beginning of the surveys is how, yes, um, some people have said, oh, well, it's, it's okay that everyone saved a load of money during COVID. Um, a, it was only the generally more affluent who did manage to save during COVID. And B, we are seeing that a lot of those groups that had said they had savings are already saying it's gone. So I think we need to burst that myth and go, yeah, people are now having to draw down on savings or risking getting into into properly into debt. 
Yeah, no, that's really interesting. Um, another question I've got for you, um, and it almost builds off the back of that, is around, uh, and again, this is going to be a, you know, a, a big, broad question, but how would you almost summarise the impact of this crisis on all the different sectors that we've been that we've been looking at over the last six months because it's been it's been really really kind of um universal hasn't it yeah and and again we we had that situation where when we started looking at this we didn't have any real evidence of 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 what people were spending and seeing those spend cuts now beautiful beauty is over the time we've now started getting these regular feeds of transactional data and at risk of sort of plugging that into the, the new year, we're, we're launching our brand dimensions piece in the new year where we will actually be able to start tracking that month by month across a whole lot of brands. But yeah, what we saw early on was quite interesting that, yeah, we were hearing people in the in the surveys saying, right, we're going to stop spending in restaurants or we're going to cut back in restaurants. There were people saying they were going to cut back on fast food. They were saying, ah, oh, no, we're going to keep spending on um, home and garden. That's really important to us. But actually, some of those things have carried through. Unfortunately, people said they were going to cut their fashion spend. They have. We're now seeing that in transactions. People were saying they were going to cut restaurant spend. We are now seeing in transaction spend that restaurants are down. But sectors like fast food is doing reasonably well. Yes, deliveries have dropped, but that's kind of probably just rebounding to a more sensible level because you had the COVID bubble of the deliveroos and just eats of this world. Um, but yeah, cafes and coffee shops, which people said, yeah, we can, we can get, a, get a, we can stop spending there. Actually transaction spend stayed pretty high. And there is this thing you hear about in a number of places around that sort of affordable, affordable treats. And that seems to be what started to happen. The people are maybe going, I'm going to have a takeaway while I'm out because it's cheap and easy. I'm going to go for a coffee because I want to do something fun. But yeah, that big meal, I'm cutting some of those. So, um, and yeah, just just finishing off on that, um, the home sector, data I saw recently from transactional spend seems to show really quite stark drops over the last, uh, well, on the year-on-year comparisons. But again, some of this we have to caveat is, is that against false numbers from COVID? So, yeah, restaurants are down because we all went a bit, yeah, we're going to go out and eat because we haven't been able to. And we're going to have staycations. And we're gonna, now we're spending abroad. But, yeah, same with home and garden. Actually, an awful lot of spend got pulled forward that people were stuck in those homes. They bought that sofa. They bought the desk. They redecorated because they had nothing better to do. The trouble is everyone's targets and expectations are set on those inflated levels. And we've now had the double whammy of both we're now not stuck in our homes, fab, but we've also got less less money to spend. So, yeah, it's been really interesting to see how things have changed and how people's perceptions versus actually what you're seeing in transactions may be different. And that's why we're trying to put that whole package together. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of what you're describing there is a lipstick effect coming out in other forms, isn't it? I mean, what you just said about the takeaways versus the restaurants. Um, I... Um, a conversation we were having recently um, with a client, we were talking about how her home furnishings, for example, might be a, might be a much bigger deal now compared to um, this kind of big durable goods because people still want to make their homes look nice. Uh, they don't quite have the the funds at the moment to do the big renovations, but what they can do is replace their sheets and their cushions, um, yeah, to make everything feel a bit nicer. So yeah, it's it's really interesting to see that that lipstick effect come through into most of the sectors that you just talked about. Yeah. So to turn it back to you then, um, have you had any surprises that you've seen in the data? I think um, the consumer behaviour and consumer sentiment angle, uh, which is of particular interest to me because of um, my kind of involvement with the surveys, I found it amazing how preemptive consumers were about the crisis that was coming um, from uh, down the road. For example, we had one of the warmest Octobers and Novembers on record, um, according according to the news. Um, however, the shops were still already selling out of electric blankets, electric heaters, hot water bottles. Consumers are smart, and consumers knew this was going to come, and um, they were looking for ways to mitigate it a lot a lot longer before than uh, we actually. I mean, this is the first week we've actually had any cold weather. Um, 
and finally people are getting to use this stuff. So that was really interesting to me, how how consumers are so ahead in terms of how they're thinking about how this, this recession, this cost of living is going to affect them. But then the big paradox with that was how everyone behaved over summer. Um, because we then saw this really hedonistic um, behaviour with restaurant spend, spend on socialising, spend on events and gigs and all the kind of things that um, for many people give their lives meaning. That that, that kind of spend shot up massively um, to above 2019 levels in some cases. So kind of complete pre-pandemic growth as well. So um, consumers are both very smart, um, which, you know, doesn't surprise me, of course, but it's, it's nice to see the proof of it. Uh, but also the fact that, um, yeah, we, we, we still we still cherish that social post pandemic summer, despite the fact that we knew what was coming down the road. And um, so, yeah, that 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 whole kind of paradox really, really stuck out to me. Last question from me is um, we had an interesting political year as well. Um, what are your thoughts on the interventions that came into play to try and protect um, some of the most vulnerable communities in our country during this quite difficult time? Yeah, OK, try not to get too involved in the politics on that one. But um, I think I think what came across incredibly clearly from our early scenario runs on this was that the government had to do something on fuel cost rising. All of our scenarios showed huge hits, particularly to the most vulnerable groups in terms of their disposable incomes. And you could see it bleeding up through the ACORN groups. Something had to be done. And actually, when we then ran the scenarios on the interventions that were done in terms of the cap, the 400, 450 pound um, intervention to everybody, and then the 600 odd for the, the lowest income groups, did massively turn my scenario chart from a load of dangerous reds into much more sort of light blues and, and blues. So yes, that was a good thing. I must say I'm still surprised that the interventions were, certainly the later interventions on fuel, were not aimed specifically at lower demographic groups. Um, there are groups that we are seeing in our latest scenarios that we're seeing something like 16% of struggling estates may have outgoings that are bigger than their incomes. We're seeing in our next scenario that we think that that same group will see their um, disposable incomes drop by 20% in the months ahead. We're seeing groups further up the tree looking much more stable. So I think that the next set of targets has to, and it is implied by the government, will be targeted more at those that need it. Um, but I think the big challenge now is mortgages and the knock on of uh, buy to let mortgages that are going through the rental space. Um, and I think we're going to do a, a, a more focused session on mortgages in January. Um, but, yeah, we are seeing that uh, particularly young groups, often reasonably high earning young groups, could be really seriously impacted here because a lot of them are coming off um, early fixed rates uh, onto variable rates, which will be at a scale that they hadn't anticipated at the point they took that mortgage out. So, uh, yeah. yeah, so uh, a mixed bag and on, on, on government interventions. But, yeah, it's going to be a lot of changes in the year ahead. And probably that's uh, where I should wrap up by sort of in terms of what we're doing. Um, yeah, we have already lined up our plan of, 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 of of podcasts for the next six months. No doubt it will change as policy changes. But yeah, January, we're going to focus on mortgages and, and savings as well. Rachel is going to come back on again in February to look at the first tranche of data from the brand dimensions um, work that should give us a real feel for what is going on at a transaction level and also a chance to reflect on the Christmas trading that we're all sort of awaiting with bated breath. Um, we will also be looking at uh, new scenarios on paycheck and other rounds of surveys. And uh, we'll also be uh, launching the new ACORN next year and looking at what, um, how the different new ACORN groups are impacted moving forward. So it's tough outlook for Christmas. We're all unsure what trading is going to be like. And for many of us at a personal level, I know it's going to be a pretty tough Christmas as we try to 
navigate through our first Christmas post-COVID with the cost of living. So um, really, we look forward to catching up with you in the new year. Um, do contact us if you want any more target advice um, on how data can support you to navigate through this difficult market. We'll be continuing to post these podcasts and any other material that we think will be useful. So on that note, all the best for, the new, for Christmas and the new year, and we'll see you in January. Thank you.